let's move on to the very latest out of Israel. Um, we have some grim news to report this morning. Let's put this up on the screen. There are increasing signs that that Rafah invasion is all but inevitable. Um, in what some analysts, they, they write in this piece of the New York Times and residents of the city saw as a preparation of an, for an invasion, an Israeli military official on Tuesday gave some details that include relocating civilians to a, quote, safe zone. There are none of those, by the way. A few miles away along the Mediterranean coast. That would be, I believe it's called Mawasi. We've talked about this mm -hmm. before, where yes, there's, n there are no, there is nothing set up there that would enable sewage, water, s shelter, any of the basics of life. There is wildly inadequate. In any case, they go on to say just a day earlier, Israeli warplanes bombed Rafa. We covered that here. Increasing fears among some of the civilians sheltering there that a ground assault would soon follow. They interview a 57-year-old resident of Rafa who said that um, these indicators are, quote, terrifying, mean they may really be close to starting an operation. He says, our bags have been packed for months now at, for the time of evacuation. And, um, you know, to give you a sense of how much this is being cheerleaded within Israel and how many preparations are being made. An influential uh, think tank called the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv called on Israel to make, quote, brave decisions and to develop a plan for the hermetic closure of the Philadelphia Corridor in close cooperation with Egypt and the U.S. That would be a violation of the agreement between Egypt and Israel from, I believe it was 2005, that assigned, um, you know, authority to Egypt to secure that border. And then, obviously, the I can't even tell you how many how many deaths we're looking at, how much of an exacerbation of the humanitarian crisis. You know, many of the people in Rafa they're either from Gaza City or they're from Khan Yunus. Mm -hmm. Both of those cities have been wiped off the map. They're gone, yes. So there's nothing to go back to there. There is no real plan that is credible at all to protect people whatsoever. And so uh, it, it's gonna. There's just it's gonna be continued horror, like escalated horror. I, the death toll is going to be massive. The humanitarian toll is going to be gigantic. The diplomatic fallout with Egypt, God knows what's going to happen there. Egypt very upset about this direction. So um, it looks more and more like that report of Biden said, hey, if you do a more limited strike on Iran, fine, you can go into Rafah. I mean, that's looking very possible like that actually unfolded. Oh, absolutely. And if we stick with the U.S. political system and where things are, let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen because this is extraordinary. Uh, Mike Johnson says that he, and he is admitted to this, by the way, this is not even reporting, said he had called White House, specifically Jake Sullivan, to intervene and on behalf of the Israeli military if President Biden was considering slapping sanctions on that Israeli military battalion, which was charged with violating human rights in the West Bank. Again, keep in mind, this is in the West Bank. These are allegations that actually stem both before October 7th and others that is a violation of the State Department's Leahy Law, which says that we will sanction any individual and not provide any U.S. support to military battalions or forces which are engaged in what the U.S. State Department determines is an ongoing human rights abuse. An independent report, which we covered here, had previously identified human rights abuses by this IDF battalion inside of the occupied West Bank, and that with that policy was a violation of law. And our speaker actually called, and it appears, Crystal, he was successful, and it does not look like these sanctions are going through. The the White House is pushing back on that, but yeah. you're right that there was I mean, there are reports yeah. and it hasn't happened yet. And there were multiple right. reports that the White House was backing off of this. And there's a lot of things to say about this. Number one, just one. There are many incidents of, you know, documented torture allegations and all sorts of horrifying things from this unit, which is this um, unit that's set up specifically for the ultra-Orthodox, has a bunch of these quote unquote hilltop youth, sort of like radical, often violent settlers that are in this unit. So surprise, surprise, lots of human rights violations. Um, and one of them include, it, it was a Palestinian American who was an elderly man, I think around 80 years old, who was tortured, handcuffed, and left in the cold to die. That's one of the allegations and incidents here that we're talking about. So our own speaker, the supposedly American Speaker of the House, begging this administration to violate U.S. law to let this unit off the hook for uh, killing an American citizen. Like, it's insane. And, you know, 
um, critical of the very limited nature of this to begin with, because the whole conceit from the Biden administration is, oh, it's just a few bad apples, that it isn't the direct result of overwhelming government policy. But it's at least something. And clearly the Netanyahu administration doesn't like it. So in any case, extraordinary. He revealed this, by the way, to Hugh Hewitt. He said, quote, we heard a rumor of this before our aid bill was actually brought for a vote in the House. I mean, hours before. I'll tell you what I did, Hugh, and I don't, I guess I'm breaking news here. No one knows this, but I called the White House immediately and talked with Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken was overseas at mm -hmm. the moment. Yep, there you go. So that's one where it's very, very clear, I think, where things are going and also the defense that they have with the political system as we grapple with what a potential invasion of Rafa would look like. We'd also be remiss if we didn't give everybody an update on the Gaza floating pier. Yeah, tell me, how is how is construction going? The US military was supposed, we were putting our servicemen in danger, building this pier, all of that. We recently uh, got an update from the US military Pentagon spokesperson. Turns out not a single thing is actually close to being operational. Here's what he had to say. You have the temporary pier, uh, which is, of course, several miles offshore, uh, which can receive both military and civilian vessels. There has been no physical construction of the, the temporary pier or the causeway. Um, we are uh, positioned to begin construction very soon, in the very near future. So very <laughs> soon in the near future. It has now been 48 days since Brujo. I can't believe State of the Union is 48 days ago. I feel like I'm living in a time vacuum. I feel like I was yeah, just here covering it. But yeah. okay, put that aside. It feels like just yesterday we were covering it. We were talking about it. We were doing segments about it. It's been 50 days now uh, and nothing is happening. In the near future, it may be operational. They put out all those diagrams. It's like, is this even going to happen at this point? Mm. Doesn't look like it. And in the interim, the whole reason that it was supposed to happen was that more aid was supposed to go into the Gaza Strip and then that hasn't happened either. So what has the damage rot been in the meantime? So more fecklessness in, on the part of the U.S. It's administration. It's just, they think we're yeah. so stupid. You know, I mean, we, we, most people are. Like, we honestly called this from the beginning yeah. that it was a total PR stunt. We're skeptical if it was even going to happen. We knew it was going to say they were claiming 60 days at most. At most, they were, weren't they saying 30 to 60 days? Isn't that what they were saying? Yes, that's right. That's what they said. Here we are 48 days later, and they have not even started and cannot even give us a date for when it would start. Like, this was just a lie, something for Joe Biden to say in the State of the Union to pretend like he cares about Palestinian civilians starving to death and dying en masse. Uh, they haven't even started. They haven't even started. Just, just incredible. Um, meanwhile, so you've got the imminent invasion of Rafah. You already have um, amped up strikes, which are killing Palestinian civilians and many children. Now you also have um, Gaza basically coming to the West Bank. Let's put this up on the screen. There's been very little reporting on this, apparently, even though there's been this has been ongoing for a while. Their headline here is uh, Israel's hunt for one elusive militant brings Gaza tactics to the West Bank, airstrikes, drones and ground troops targeting militants turn Palestinian territory into another war front. So, you know, we have already had the war expanded into Lebanon and Syria and Iran and now ramping up also in the West Bank. And, you know, make no mistake about it, they've killed more than 435 Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem since October 7th. Uh, about 4,900 Palestinians have been injured in the West Bank specifically since then, either by Israeli forces or by settlers. We brought you that news previously of that um, Israeli settler pogrom that mm -hmm. unfolded with, with the IDF just standing by and watching. So, um, you know, West Bank increasingly looking more like the Gaza Strip in terms of Israeli tactics. And then the last thing we wanted to share with you is this um, little nugget from the New York Times with this up on the screen. This went uh, sort of unremarked upon, but seems pretty significant. The headline here is the stark reality of Israel's fight in Gaza. And they're saying basically, you know, similar to like what Haaretz had written before about if you look at their stated goals, it's not going too well. You know, they aren't really accomplishing their mission. We saw those reports yes. that Finwar is sort of still yeah, openly still. operating. The Israelis of Clay always just hunkered down in this tunnel and can't do anything. There were some reports, at least, that were very contrary to that. But specifically, what I wanted to point to in this piece is they say, quote, in an annual intelligence assessment released in March, American spy agencies expressed doubts 
about Israel's ability to truly destroy Hamas, which the U.S. has designated as a terrorist group, Israel probably will face a lingering armed resistance from Hamas for years to come, the report said, and the military will struggle to neutralize Hamas's underground infrastructure, which allows insurgents to hide, regain strength, and surprise Israeli forces. So even the U.S. intel community is saying, like, you're not going to defeat Hamas. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's the conceit with Rafa is like, oh, once we do, that's the final boss, right? Once we go into Rafa, then finally Hamas will be defeated. And this is just, it's just bullshit. It's just going to cause more misery and suffering. I come back to what someone on Twitter, some wise person on Twitter said, which is like, they've managed to destroy everything in Gaza except for Hamas. Yeah, it is uh, astounding that according to this, that Sinwar still maintains command and control of the organization. It's like a glaring failure. It's a lot like the bin Laden thing, actually. Uh, Afghanistan is the perfect example. Yeah. So we had a couple of options in Afghanistan. We could have gone in, thrown everything at the Battle of Tora Bora, actually killed bin Laden, mm -hmm. and then we could have gotten the hell out of there. Instead, we get distracted. We want to, oh, now we're propping up the freedom forces, and now we're going to build a you know democracy. In the Israeli case, they're just wiping out basically every building that exists for any future operation, but the actual like people responsible for October 7, they don't seem to have you know any actually been punished in the way that they allegedly could have been. And you could have just had a dedicated counterterrorism operation from the beginning, which would have done this. You could have avoided all this carnage and all this nonsense. And very much like us, they will likely reap the reward of that, which is an ongoing mass terrorist blob inside of Gaza that is ungovernable inside of a chaos that will bother them now for years and years and years to come. So good luck to them. And uh, they, they, look, they they are solely responsible now at this point and, for what they're going to reap. And also, like, uh, it's nice that the media is now, like, actually waking up to this fact or actually mm. admitting this fact. But we've been saying this from the beginning. Mean, we played that Jocko Willick clip how oh, early yeah, yeah. on it's when not, he was like it does it's not rocket science if you yeah. actually if, okay if yeah. you're serious about counterinsurgency yeah. here's how you do it you're actually really nice to the civilian yeah. population yeah. you flood them with aid because you want to create a wedge between them and hamas they haven't had any other option than hamas as their government so you have to give them some other alternative that's going to satisfy their aspirations. So whether that's, you know, it talks towards peace, some sort of negotiation. We know throughout history with the Gaza Strip, when negotiations and possibility of peace were ongoing, support for militant groups like Hamas were much lower. So you do that. You also need the civilian population to collaborate with you and tell you where Sinwar is hiding or whatever. And then you do count targeted counterinsurgency strikes. That's the way you do that. It was never approached that way. Instead, the first thing they do, it was bomb the hell out of Gaza and kill a bunch of kids and civilians and bury them under ru rubble and drop 2,000 pound bombs on refugee camps and uh, raid hospitals, et cetera. That was the first approach. So we always knew this was not some intelligent, strategic, targeted attempt to get the baddies who, um, you know, fomented October 7th are genuine bad guys. Like, I'm not, you know, denying that. But we always knew that. And now here we are, what are we, seven months in now at this point? And they're finally like, oh, by the way, this may not work. It's like, no shit. And how many of these people who you've, kids who you've orphaned and murdered their brother and sister, left them amputees for life, whatever, how, how peace-loving do you think that they're going to be in the future? How many new re Hamas recruits do you think that you have created while you've been doing this? And there's no end in sight. No end in sight whatsoever. Absolutely. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to BreakingPoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's BreakingPoints.com.